Our goal today is going to be to solve first order linear differential equations. Now, in this context, the function we've got is y, the variable is t or x or whatever other letter you want. Now, the worst that a general first order equation could look is like this, y prime of t plus p of t y is g of t. These are models for what are called RC circuits and RL circuits in engineering. First special case we're going to talk about is we'll say, look, if we've got y prime of x, if this thing is just a function of x, that means it's the variable only. All you need to do is to anti-differentiate this. It's very straightforward. You can take an antiderivative of both sides. Remember that you'll get some functiony part plus this arbitrary constant. The arbitrary constant says that there are infinitely many answers to this problem. Now we don't typically write it with that capital letter. We will just keep it as is like this. Now as a very simple example of this, right? Let's say we wanted to solve y prime of x as cosine of x. y of x would simply be the antiderivative of this and you'd get sine of x plus a constant. This is what we call the general solution. Again, every DE has a general solution that always has this arbitrary constant. In the context of an initial value problem, you're able to determine what that constant will be. So what's an initial value problem? Again, you've got a differential equation plus some extra condition about the function that you've got. So the DE gives you a general solution of sine x plus a constant. Now, in order to determine the constant, you're going to apply those initial conditions. So if you apply the initial conditions, you're going to consider the function you just got, and you're going to plug in zero. And when you plug in zero, you'll get a C in this case. Now you're going to compare this to the initial conditions that you've been given. And what that's going to tell you is that C has to be four. And so then what you get is you get what's called a particular solution. So this is the one and only one answer to your initial value problem. It has the functiony part that satisfies the differential equation plus this constant that will satisfy the initial condition. Another special case is that you've got a function that looks like this, where you've got y prime of x is some L of y. And this is a linear function of y. So a really useful example for us here is going to be something like this. If you've got r prime of t is your function and it's equal to itself, kr, then what you can do is something from calc 2. You can separate variables. So if you separate variables, you can essentially group together all the parts with the functions. And this is where here we're going to get lucky. From the chain rule, this thing right here is the derivative of the natural log of r of t. Oh, that was so lucky because now this is a problem we can solve like we did above. We just take an antiderivative of both sides. So we anti-differentiate this, we'll get kt plus a constant. And that means that if we want to find out what r is, all we need to do is undo the log. So we'll apply an exponential to both sides. We'll get e to the kt plus c. A big part of this course is being really comfortable with properties of logs and exponentials. This is a property of exponentials where you're going to realize that a sum upstairs turns into a product downstairs. And we're going to play this game with constants. If you've got an arbitrary constant C, using it as a power of some exponential, it's just some other constant. You could call it C1 or C2 or D or alpha, or you can just rename it as C again. It doesn't matter. It's an arbitrary constant. And so what you have found is that 
you can solve this problem kind of easily, right? It's possible for you to get a formula in this case. Again, this is a general solution because there are infinitely many answers. Now, that last idea was very nice. Can I use this in general? And what I mean by that is, I, if I take a general linear equation like this, is it possible to turn this side into a perfect derivative? Because if it is, then I can just use an antiderivative and solve the problem. I'm going to say this. Can I find some function r of t that lets me convert this de into a perfect derivative? And so what I mean by that is, is there some mystery function so that if I multiply it on all sides of this de, so whatever I do to the left, I have to do to the right, is it possible for me to turn this into something that is a perfect derivative? And I'm just going to say, well, maybe it'll be a product of these two things. That's my goal. I don't know if it's going to work. I don't know what function is going to do the job, but can I do this? So I need these left-hand sides to match. And that means, okay, on the one left-hand side, I've got r of t, y prime of t, r of t, p of t, y of t. There's one. Now from the product rule, I'll have r prime of t, y of t, plus r of t, y prime of t. Well, these two terms are common, so I can get rid of those. The only way these are going to be the same is if I have r, r of t, p of t, y of t equals r prime of t, y of t. And there's a y that's common, so I can kind of get rid of that. And that means that I need r of t to satisfy an equation like I just dealt with. r prime of t is p of t r of t. Oh, I can solve this. I can solve this like above. I already did this. It's going to be a little bit different here because there's not a constant on this side. On this side, there's a function. Now, again, from the chain rule, I can realize that this is just the derivative of the natural log, and that's equal to p of t. But same idea. I'm going to anti-differentiate both sides. Now we'll have r of t has to be the following function. It has to be e to the power of this thing plus a constant. We can play the same game that we had before. We can separate this out. And this is just going to be c e to the whatever up there. This tells me there are infinitely many functions that will do the job. If you study the left-hand side and you look at that function p of t, if you take it, find its antiderivative, and use it as a power, you're going to be able to multiply this entire equation by r of t on both sides, and it will turn into a perfect derivative. You'll be able to do that. Now, you can see that if I put an r of t on both sides, it doesn't matter what constant I choose. The, the constant's going to cancel out. You can just take c equals 1 or anything other than 0, right? If you do this, you are going to get this side equals all of this stuff. And then you can go ahead and anti-differentiate. And that's how you can go ahead and solve this problem. 
Now, you should not memorize whatever formulas we get here. That is not the point at all. What you should be doing is knowing how to do this process. If you know how to do this process, you will be able to come up with any formulas you need. Now, remember, if I put an exponential in the downstairs, I will be able to simply take it upstairs by using a negative sign. Now, we talked about Newton's law of cooling, and I'm going to show you that, hey, this was the problem we talked about last time. Newton's law of cooling works like this. If you take a look, this is really a linear first order differential equation. This thing right here is p of t. So that means this function r of t, we're going to give this a fancy name. We're going to call it the integrating factor. So this is going to be e to the antiderivative p of t dt. So this is going to be e to the antiderivative of 1 over 5 dt. So that's going to be e to the t over 5. That's the magic function that I need to multiply both sides of this equation by to turn it into a perfect derivative on the left-hand side. So if I take e to the t over 5 and I multiply it on both sides, it will always be the case that this turns into a perfect derivative of the integrating factor times my function. And I can get to there. And once I've got that, all I need to do is simply anti-differentiate. And when I anti-differentiate this, I need to use substitution rule. u is t over 5. du is dt over 5. When I go ahead and I do that substitution, I'm going to end up with a 50 e to the t over 5 plus an arbitrary constant. So I'm not quite done here. I'm going to isolate the t, and I'll get c e to the negative t over 5 plus 50. This is the general solution of the differential equation. So if somebody supplies us with some initial conditions at time zero, let's say, and let's say it's some temperature, we can apply them. So t of zero is going to be 50 minus c e to the zero, and that has to be equal to t naught. So that means that this arbitrary constant is going to be t naught minus 50. Sorry, I think I got, sorry. That's not a minus, that's not a minus, that's a positive, there we go, t naught minus 50. So the solution to the initial value problem, where I have Newton's law of cooling, looks like this. I will get one and only one answer, that I will have 50 plus t naught minus 50 e to the negative t over 5. If you plot this, we will have some sort of decaying exponential as time goes to infinity. Now, physics people like to give parts of these solutions different names. This is what's called the steady state solution because as time goes to infinity, the solution just goes to this value. And because of this decaying exponential, this part of the solution is called the transient. It goes to zero as time goes to infinity. So if I pick some value greater than 50, so if I pick some value like 90, what's going to happen is I'll have this decaying exponential and it'll eventually go to the steady state. If I pick a value that's negative, it's going to rise and increase in temperature until it hits that steady state. So in this way, we are able to get formulas for our linear first order differential equations. Now, this is really important because this will allow us to solve a lot of problems going forward.